last August that education students went to Costa Rica and worked with um, residents at Monte Javier. Uh, the participants of our study were nine Mary Mount graduate, undergraduate, and alumni, all studying in special education or general education. Um, and also the uh, residents at Monte Javier and at Monte the residents are children and adults with severe disabilities and the illnesses. And specifically, cerebral policy and financial balance in life goes to it. Our research took place at Mana Javier Nest, which is a permanent residence in Costa Rica for individuals with special needs. Uh, Mana Javier Nest Foundation is dedicated to the care and treatment of children and adults with severe disabilities and similar illnesses. Uh, we focus most of our interactions with the adult residents. Uh, we weren't allowed to take many pictures of the residents in the privacy reasons, but this is um, one of the field trips that the residents took. Um, the other picture is a picture of the main hospital, which houses more of the um, residents who have more severe medical needs than the children. Uh, the adult uh, residents who are behind the main hospital. Um, these are a few of the um, activities that we did with the uh, residents in the special education classroom. In order to form our research question, we selected pre and post experience reflection data. This qualitative method allowed us to narrow our focus. All nine participants expressed excitement over the opportunity to be able to learn about the culture of Costa Rica and also to develop strategies to avoid the neglect of the local. The primary concern of all of the participants was how the learning and language barriers would affect our ability. After we collected all of the pre experience data, we analyzed it and developed our research question, which is how will the limited capacity to communicate with the residents affect our ability to teach, address, dabble, and dabble. We found several studies that um, that supported our research. The first study found that despite the differences in the ability to communicate, um, both teachers and students were able to make contributions um, in the classroom activity. Um, another study you know, emphasized the impact of making sure that individuals who communicate non-verbally and those who communicate with them are equal partners in the communication process. Um, and that you become aware of your own communicative strategies so that you can use different um, strategies and techniques to meet those needs of those learners that um, can do, communicate non verbally. All right, so uh, before going down to Alajuela and visiting the residents in Costa Rica, we actually uh, came up with the lessons and course materials here in the United States with the uh, assistance of Dr. Ball. And we base these activities on recommendations that the special educator in Costa Rica provided with us from the previous year. So we went into it with um, very little knowledge of the individuals to be working with. Um, that was done on purpose to kind of help us learn on the go and not have too many preconceived ideas before uh, meeting the residents. So we had four main themes that we tried to develop our curricula around. The first was cultural exchange. We also looked at tactile literacy self-advocacy, and then creativity and visual arts. So these are the four areas of focus. Uh, we, some of the Marymount students that went down created a PowerPoint on uh, what it's like to be an, an American, some of the sports, the food, the activities that we enjoy, and trying to establish connections with the Costa Rican culture as well to stress those uh, connections and identify with the individuals we are working with. We also wanted to emphasize tactile literacy. Uh, so engaging residents and making sure that it was multi-sensory, the different activities that we were working on. So connecting colors and ideas and textures with the concepts that we were working on with them and in the activities that we developed. Self-advocacy was also a big uh, goal of ours, was to help these residents become more self-confident and self-aware. Uh, they created their own books, uh, the All About Me books that you might have been familiar with working in kindergarten and uh, as a younger student, um, just to help them share with us their favorite ideas, their dreams, their goals, and to tell us about themselves. And then with all of the activities we did, we stressed creativity and giving 
residents an opportunity to choose their own materials and really make these activities their own. So again, trying to uh, emphasize that individuality and telling us about who they are and sharing their ideas uh, and making the activities their own. One of the uh, big projects that I was in charge of was the Tactical Literacy Project. And as Kristen touched on, Tactical Literacy is a multi-sensory approach to literacy education. The students are interacting with the text and not only what they see and what they hear, but also what they can touch and feel, I and mean, even in some cases, smell. Um, so I took the very hundred caterpillars, and the caterpillar and the butterfly are big um, symbols in the history and culture. And I took different materials and um, textures and colors and embellish the pictures with them. This um, multimodal experience for students is extremely important to the building fix because it provides them an alternative means to access the text so they can see it, hear it, and feel it. Um, and the students also made their own chapter books that they used with the uh, kids in the main hospital. And when we told the adult residents that they would be um, creating this book to use with the um, with the children. They were so excited and engaged because it gave a sense of purpose to the activity. And we've been promoting our self-advocacy. That was one of our goals um, going to the group. One of the ways that we made this possible for some of the students that had limited fine motor was through the use of adaptive scissors. And these adaptive scissors were made possible um, from fine scissors to be over a very mouth. Um, one of the residents who um, had very limited motor um, function was only able to move his arms and hands just about like this. Um, and he had never used scissors when he was able to cut at all. And so he used to be adaptive scissors for the first time to be able to do that. And I will never forget the look on his face. He just lit up with excitement that he was able to do this for the first time. And he spent two hours making his book, his uh, page of the book, because he was so meticulous in cutting his teeth and doing it down. He was so excited to end the product. And he signed his name at the bottom so that everybody knew that it was him that made this page. So, at the end of all of our daily lessons, we, um, Compare the results of our pre and post reflection to really assess what we learned and the impact that it had. Uh, one of the things we were really concerned about was the communication barrier, not only through the spoken language, which many of us want to learn Spanish, but also because many of the residents were non verbal. Uh, but we found through um, using alternative forms of communication, either through um, inventive signing, um, facial expression, body language, I mean, even one of the most profound for me was meaning conveyed through just a single touch. We were still able to form those um, essential meaningful relationships with the residents and still convey the content that we needed to do our lessons. So the other uh, activity and that was incorporated in our work was the ability to scaffold. That was a skill that we definitely um, worked on trying to develop with our residents. Um, and they really taught us that skill. We went down really nervous because we didn't know the population we were working with. And we learned to work with them in understanding where they were coming from and what their capabilities were. Um, so that scaffolding component is all about assessing where the residents are coming from, what strengths they're bringing to the table, and then going in the positive direction, emphasizing those skills and capabilities and helping them um, to develop those. Uh, but also trying to make sure we didn't contribute to learned helplessness and help them too much in areas that they were totally capable of doing. So it was really about establishing that communication with them um, and having them tell us and share with us what they were able to do. So part of being able to uh, develop effective scaffolding is to be able to effectively success. And because the severity of the developmental needs of laws of residents and one of the field has that to be challenging. So while we were there, the bank participants developed different ways to assess, and we found that the uh, importance of flexibility and in dealing with the of mindfulness. The most important lesson that we learned there while we were there was that human connection, often unspoken, can trump all of the communication barriers. The thing that we were most worried about, we ended up being able to overcome a lot easier than we had anticipated. These connections were able to guide our teaching and inform our assessments, and it also taught us to bring help into the classroom.
some of the forms of assessment that we um, did on the go were watching facial expressions. If we noticed that a student had a frustrated look on their face, and that it was clear to us that we needed to go over to help. Um, sometimes the students would point to their to their work or motion us over so that we knew that they needed help. Um, sometimes we would notice that a resident was kind of just looking off in the space. That was clear to us that either they couldn't access the activity or they were bored with it. So again, that was a clue that we needed to change what we were doing um, and jump in to help them. So um, based on what we learned, every night we would come together and kind of have that round table effect. Um, after dinner, we just get together, all of the education students, and discuss the needs and ideas and just what was kind of coming, floating through our heads about the activities we've been doing and the residents we've been interacting with. And from that, uh, the product that we formed was a recommendation form um, for, for the individuals that, were, uh, that reside in uh, Manos Abiertas and for the, their caretakers as well. Some of the strengths that we noticed, um, some things that we thought might be beneficial for the residents to get involved with and to help each other with, um, and just things that we, we had come up with um, based on our observations with the limited time that we had to work with the residents. We also use this information to create a profile form um, for to be used for assessment uh, in the future by groups going down to Costa Rica and by uh, the caretakers at Mano Sabiosa. So here's a page of that recommendation form that we put together. Um, first, again, we wanted to emphasize the strengths of the residents we were working with. Olga was uh, one of the individuals who was definitely very highly functioning. She was actually deaf, and she used inventive forms of sign language. So she had come up with her own signs um, to communicate with us what she needed. She was also very perceptive, really good at helping us interact with the residents. Um, so she knew their individual needs and was so very much took on that leadership and mother type role of helping us um, assist and adapt to the needs of the residents. So we analyzed and looked at these skills that she had and tried to come up with some recommendations of how she could be better, um, how her skills could be better employed in the community at Manos. Uh, so we had suggested that perhaps she could design activities for the other residents. She was really intelligent and very knowledgeable about their particular needs and concerns. Um, so we wanted to see her, perhaps if possible, having a more proactive role and a leadership opportunity um, at the on-site. So here's that profile form that we mentioned earlier. Um, so based on those recommendations that we were coming up with, we kind of analyzed and took some of the themes that we were noticing and what kinds of um, ideas we, had, we were looking at specifically. And we came up with specific domains uh, that we were trying to assess these residents on. Specifically, the first one would be communication, strengths, and needs. So looking at what forms of communication these residents began with and what their, their natural forms of communication were when we first got there. How did they want to interact with us? Um, we tried to let them share with us their preferred means of communication, whether it be vocalization, verbalization, picture communication, inventive sign language. Um, so taking note of what their preferred methods were and then maybe offering some recommendations of how to make that, that communication more accessible. We also wanted to take note of their preferred activities and interests. So going off of what they liked and uh, what their preferred activities were in order to build off those in an academic setting. Also learning preferences, especially the sensory profile. For individuals with special needs and those with um, physical limitations, a lot of the individuals were in wheelchairs um, and had uh, very limited fine and gross motor skills. So how they were able to interact with us, whether it be picture communication um, or vocalizations. We wanted to uh, incorporate those in their learning preferences and see how they preferred to interact with their environment. And then um, we also looked at social skills, their motor skills and adaptive skills, and their academics and cognitive abilities. So all of these things we were taking note of as we were interacting with the residents. And that capstone component would be the vocational potential. So again, what recommendations we had for integrating those individuals into the community and getting them to have a more proactive um, position at Manos and being able to feel like they had uh, the opportunity to contribute to the community um, there and the other residents as well. So this is taken um, in Costa Rica. 
passed right before we left outside a bus stop on one of the really um, poorer areas of Costa Rica. And it um, had a profound effect on all of us because um, it really embodied the essence of, of our experience at Monos because we were so worried about our communication barriers and how that was going to affect us. And none of our worries came to fruition. So in a sense, it was as if the impossible really only existed. And there were nine education students. We also worked in the college with um, nursing students. Um, I think we were there about 20 or so nursing students. Um, and we were there for about 10 days. Well, one one thing, or yeah. So one idea that um, we were working on, uh, thinking about implementing, was that we really wanted to pilot this in a setting that we could um, observe here in the U.S. Uh, so I know that there's a, a program called the Stratford Program at Woodlawn High School. Um, so working with individuals in this immediate area with special needs in that self-contained classroom. And we think it'd be a great idea to have students try to have an opportunity here in the States to, to pilot that um, profile form and just practice assessing individuals' needs and then um, making recommendations based on that. So perhaps in the future, that might be an opportunity for Marymount students to, to partake in. Yeah. 